Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Siwoo from Vivo Music Festival. And today, um, I'm, I'm here with Gabriel Campos Zamora, clarinetist, uh, principal clarinetist of the Minnesota Orchestra. And I should just start addressing you like that all the time. Uh, clarinetist Gabriel Campos Zamora, how are you doing today? I'm calling from my new apartment. I just moved in here three days ago. Oh, awesome. Wow, you must have been busy. Yeah, I have been. So, so this is the one part of the apartment that looks presentable. Yeah. If I turn my camera around, you could see that um, it's full of boxes. Here, I'll just do it, actually. So pretty part. Ooh, Not so pretty part. <laughs> wow. Growing up, Gabby. Uh, sorry, everyone. We call him Gabby affectionately. Well, I, I, I think uh, people of all ages move all the time, so you will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, fun fact, uh, Gabby lived in the apartment in New York that I live in now. And one summer, I even um, rented his room for like a month uh, or something. My room? I think so. I remember there was one time you were visiting the apartment. And th this is hilarious. Like, uh, Gabby came into my room while I was sleeping in the morning with a cup of coffee, coffee for me. And then he played a recording of him performing at Tango. And he's like, what do you think? What do you think? <laughs> I was like, Gabby, this is like 8 a.m. <laughs> well, see, well, the majority of people are awake by 9, 8 a.m., first of all. And it's <laughs> true um, that uh, Jack, obviously, who, who yeah. many of you know, um, Jack Stoltz, that is, um, myself and another um, flute player named Nick, we started the so-called frat house tradition uh, by four. 161st Street um, in Washington Heights and Henry Wong who's this wonderful violinist moved after I moved out I think right he took over my room yeah and since we've had a myriad of people coming in and out all music related um, members of the Calidore Quartet yeah um, I actually went to school with those guys in LA yeah um, and at least one of them is still in that apartment. And your apartment or your former apartment in New York, I know you're in Columbus now, is in the same building, isn't it? Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm still paying for rent, you know. That's, oh, yeah. well. So a lot of people have lived at the frat house on 161st. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it, it's just like it's to how tiny our music world is, right? Like, I think I was at Juilliard during that time and you were doing On Top of Connect. Um, and now we're all yes. like school and institutions, but still there are, you know, there's Chamber Music Society and Lincoln Center members. And I, I don't yeah. know, we're all, it's a tiny little bubble. Um. <laughs> yeah, indeed. In fact, I, I just came back from a festival in Brainerd, Minnesota. Yeah. And there's this pianist named Henry. Perhaps who I had actually met through you. Sorry. Kramer. Yeah. 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 So, so who I actually met through you. Um, I think he was either finishing at Juilliard or he had been at Juilliard, but he was still friends with you and he would visit. And I distinctly remember his face and he remembered mine, we just couldn't quite um, figure out where we'd met. And, and we figured out that we had probably hung out at least once in the city. Yeah, I mean, you guys are supposed to be here at the end of this month together. Um, but you know, that'll right. happen uh, next summer, knocking on wood. Um, but, um, for now, at least, you know, we have the technology to be able to connect like this and sure. do some other creative projects. Um, so tonight we're going to be listening to the Brahms clarinet quintet. This is a, um, Gabby, you've been here I think three summers and you've really become a staple, yeah. you know, the, the Brahms, I think, uh, for Jack, both Jack and I, it was one of our, our most, uh, favorite performances. Um, we just thought it just really turned out well. Um, it was from the audience and also like from me, like being in the group, I just remember it being a very um, memorable one. Um, and we're excited to share that with our listeners today. Um, and I mean, as a clarinetist, you must have played that piece like 300 times by now. Um, uh, not quite 300 times. Uh, by now I've played it a few times, but um, I think that when I played it with you guys, that might have only been the second or third time. Wow. Yeah, I had read it at a music festival, but we never got around to playing it. This is uh, when Eugene Lee, the cellist, and you worked on it together. Yes, we, we had read that piece through and studied it a, a bit, mm -hmm. um, but we never got around to performing it. 
Mm -hmm. And after that, I joined um, Molly Carr's um, festival mm -hmm. in Connecticut. And I think that was the first time I ever performed it. But of course, it's one of those pieces. I'm sure that there's plenty, of, plenty more uh, pieces like that in the violin repertoire where even if you hadn't played it yet, right. you know it very well. Right, right, right. Look forward to playing those pieces. And, and the, the Brahms clarinet quintet is, is certainly one of those pieces. Well, you know, I, for, for me, I remember just thinking how, I thought it was just very neat how like you and Sujin had worked on it together in the past. And the violinist Alexi Kenny and I had performed it together like a couple of years before that. Um, so I thought it was kind of cool to like come from like these two different approaches. And of course, for Matthew Lippman, the violist, it was his first time ever actually. And oh, like a consummate pro, he was just able to like just call us and like just hold us all together and the, uh, with that middle voice. Um, but I, it was it was a I thought that was just really interesting, um, and just neat. Um, but for you, like, uh, are there any like particular memories associated with um, working on this piece with this particular group? Because you know, as even if there's a single piece with different iterations of musicians, the experience can completely change. I think there's a common denominator with great groups. Mm. Um, there's a few, actually. One of them is um, the lack of need to talk through everything. That's true, yeah. Um, which is usually a very good barometer of mm. how well that group listens yeah. to its members, where you don't have to stop and explain to somebody what the score looks like and how it fits together where well, you don't have to stop in the rehearsal and, and 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 tell somebody that you mean to expand the phrase time wise that is right. that you mean to as we say take a little bit of time that you mean to as all we also say and and i realize some of these terms might not be familiar to non-musicians uh, uh execute a color change for example right. some of the best groups you sit down and and people are ready to follow you and you're ready to follow them by just playing. Yeah. And um, you mentioned how Matthew Lippmann, for example, hadn't played it before. I hadn't really played it much before that. And I think sometimes you don't necessarily need the experience, but you definitely need the attitude and, mm -hmm. um, and of course, a bit of study. Um, it's not the sort of thing that just uh, comes out of nowhere. You need to know the piece or, or, or at least know how the, the pieces fit, more or less. I, I would say that's one of the common denominators, just the ability to play chamber music without words. And, and the other common denominator that I've had with great groups is an ability to mess around incessantly in rehearsal. Yeah. <laughs> to have fun to maybe be a little bit late, not too late sometimes, do a long coffee break, get a coffee, and mostly just get to know each other. And yeah. perhaps there is something about that that influences the way we play chamber music, perhaps not. I'd like to think that there is. I think more than that, it just it speaks to a connection, at least a musical connection that the musicians of the group can, can feel. Uh, it's obviously somewhat related to the first common denominator that I, described just a minute ago um but i just remember it being a very very fun group yeah i looked forward to rehearsing mm -hmm. and i'm kind of a nerd in the sense that if there's a great conductor for example in the orchestra and i'm playing a piece that i really like i'm the kind of person who gets a little bit sad when we're approaching the the 12 30 mark which is typically lunch you have to oh. stop rehearsing wow. because i like i like playing <laughs> great music, yeah. great musicians. Um, and I mean it, it especially when the, when the pieces are, are so good. Um, I guess that's all I have to say about that. I mean, that, that's great, actually. I got kind of goosebumps because like, there were certain, you know, dormant memories that you unlocked when you were saying that I remember just like us laughing and everything. But I also do remember how expedited the process was um sure. like, like really just like we would run it and then we would say let's try it again and then all of a sudden it's just better because you're right there was like such active listening and also just like um respect for the score and also respect for each other um uh, so it doesn't become like serious in the human dynamic um but there's definitely seriousness when it's like time to work 
um, like it was hyper focused, um, which is and it's a massive piece. Um, and for those of you who are listening today, if you're intending on listening to the whole thing, uh, get comfortable and maybe put on some speaker or uh, get nice speakers or headphones um, and get comfortable. Uh, and it's a real emotional journey um, written towards the end of his life. Sure. And that brings me to maybe my final question of the day. It's uh, the Brahms clarinet quintet is a staple of the chamber music repertoire, but for someone who may be listening to it for the first time today, um, we don't have program notes traditionally, um, like as in the traditional sense um, today. And um, as, some, as a clarinetist, as um, sort of the, the lead voice of this work, um, and just um, a musician who, admi musician who admires this work, um, is there something that you would want the audience to sort of think about or latch onto or take away from listening to this work? Um, Maybe perhaps it's like a personal thought of yours or some uh, biographical uh, background of the piece. Sure, uh, there are many facts that we can discuss. I'll uh, bring a few to light that I think are paramount to not just listening to this piece, but more importantly, I think interpreting it. Mm. Um, like you said, it was a piece that Brahms wrote at the end of his life. In fact, he had taken a hiatus from writing. In fact, I've heard some people say that he had retired from composing altogether. Um, and it wasn't until he heard the music, the clarinet sound of clarinetist Richard Munfeld, that he felt compelled to write again. And it wasn't just a clarinet quintet that he wrote. He wrote a, a trio. Uh, which come to think about it, I performed last summer at Vivo mm -hmm. with Sujin. Yes, yes. Um, so, and that's Opus 114, I think. Mm -hmm. gonna have, might have to correct me on that. <laughs> um, so he writes a, a clarinet trio for cello and piano, the clarinet, of course. The quintet, which is his last work for clarinet, and two clarinet sonatas as well. Mm -hmm. um, which are also transcribed by the composer uh, for the viola. Yeah. Um, and they're actually quite different. Um, the clarinet has its um, elements that make it very beautiful, and the viola has very different elements that also make it very beautiful. So he definitely had something in mind when he transcribed them himself. Mm -hmm. um, and it does have this idea of journey and, and I mean within the piece itself um, the most obvious example is the fact that the piece ends the same way the first movement ends yeah and we hear the same music from the beginning at the end and so we can extrapolate all kinds of things from that personally and I don't have any direct evidence of this I, I like to think that perhaps this piece was a sort of reflection on life as he goes through each movement. And you hear a variety of elements that are very exciting, not limited to, for example, a um, Roma-like sound in the second movement where you have the strings playing this tremoli and the clarinet playing a line that hopefully sounds like it's improvised. Mm. Um, in the second movement that is, and then we have a, a third movement that is quite light. Um, but it's the first and last movements that I think are, are quite heavy and again, reflective. And, and it really takes you through a myriad of, of emotions, just like one might when one gets to that age of, of reflection. Um, and so you say a heavy piece, but I think that if you have this, image of reflection it might not be as heavy because it might you might be able to listen through it mm -hmm. um, through in a bit of an easier way and it's not that long it's what 35 minutes perhaps is it, right, is it right. more, and it's more like 40, 40 minutes yeah i guess it depends on how long we took the second movement <laughs> um i think somebody texted you there <laughs> um but it is a beautiful piece. It's, um, 
it's rich harmonically it's very mm-hmm. interesting and and texturally too uh he's able to combine unusual sounds schumann was also and i think he actually takes quite a quite a bit from schumann in the sense of uh mixing instruments uh most notably i think it's viola and clarinet and so in the first movement as the first violin plays the melody the the clarinet and the viola are playing this really intricate inner inner melody if you will inner accompaniment Mm -hmm. uh, that i often like just playing with the viola for the sake of hearing it (laughs) yeah yeah, (laughs) for the sake of rehearsing or fixing anything just because i really like how those instruments behave together and of course there's precedent for this there's mozart had written a trio for viola and clarinet so that sound already existed right um and uh, perhaps also Brahms borrows from Mozart in, in this need to write for his clarinetist friend. Mozart had also written for his friend Anton Stadler, who was also his gambling buddy. Yeah, really? <laughs> <laughs> it was. In fact, it is said that the viola variation of the theme variations, it's Mozart's way of mocking Moonfeld for Moonfeld asking Mozart to pay his money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because apparently Moonfeld um, would bankroll Mozart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> funny. I love these stories. I don't, know where, I, I don't know where I heard that, but maybe it's true, maybe not. Um, <laughs> but, but the point is, there was, there was this amazing musician that Mozart wrote for. And, and I think Brahms also, um, uh, it's possible he might have taken after that and, and written for not just a beautiful instrument, instrument of course already existed, but a beautiful musician. Mm. Um, yeah, that's somebody weird. with, with uh, an amazing sound and and, and possibly a, a great musicianship. Yeah, you know, whenever I hear that, like you know, this um, clarinetist really inspired Brahms to come back to composing, I always wondered, like, what about his sound really attracted him to coming back to write for? I, I keep wondering, like, um, was it like the 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 way the how smooth it came out, or how, or I don't know, uh, what what qualities of the sound and his playing inspired him? I don't know if there's any text for that. Um, uh, right. Yeah. I don't know. I guess this is like, this is my first time doing this, all those who are watching, but maybe this is an opportunity for me to say, drop your thoughts below in the comments. <laughs> yeah, maybe you guys know something that we don't. Yeah, like I, for sure, the clarinet is, a clarinet is my favorite woodwind instrument. Um, sorry, guys. Are you sure you say that to every woodwind instrument you talk to? <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think what I love about it is like obviously the range, but also there's just like this liquidy, um, uh, just effortlessness that comes out like with the sound and it just glows. Uh, I just, I just love it. Um, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So it's a beautiful piece. It's one of my favorite Jeremy music pieces for sure. Yeah. Please um, enjoy the Brahms Clarinet Quintet. It's going to be, uh, it's, it's basically like reading a small book. It, one movement leads to the next um, and it's, it has an arc to it. Um, so just really think of it as going through this emotional journey as um, Gabby said. Gabby, thanks so much for making the time to meet up with me and, you know. Anytime. I mean, whenever you want to hang out, you know. Let's do it. <laughs> Stay safe, man. <laughs> okay, enjoy the show, guys. Thanks.